Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna be sharing the update with uh, Willow, who is a horse that came in for training about a week ago. If you haven't seen her first video, go back and watch that evaluation. And uh, now we're a week in, let's see where we're at now. All right, so we're gonna get started here. And what I like to do when I'm colt starting is I like to alternate between asking the horse for a yield and for a confidence thing. So there's basically three three main things that are on my mind right now. Um, number one is accepting the human. She's got to be comfortable with me. And that means, you know, me being all around her, jumping up and down next to her so that when I'm on her back, she's not afraid of the human being being on her back. That would be one thing that could get you bucked off. <laughs> the next thing that could get you bucked off is the horse, if the horse has not accepted the saddle, which also, in, which basically is a big part about them accepting something around their, their girth area. Okay. So accepting the saddle and accepting something kind of hugging them and uh, that can make them feel claustrophobic. So that's another bad reason to get bucked off <laughs> is if you haven't exposed your horse to accepting the saddle well enough and, and um, getting them used to that. The third thing is pressure. And there's three types of pressure that a horse has to get used to. Steady pressure, which is, in my opinion, one of the most innately scary things to a horse. So we really want to spend some time here. This one is the kind of boring one that I think a lot of people don't have a lot of ways to get a horse used to. Other than when we're riding them, we're using it a lot when we're riding. But in terms of preparation on the ground, it's something you really want to spend some time getting a horse used to. So that's steady pressure. That's putting a feel on the halter. That's holding her feet up. That's the girth. There's also steady pressure around her. Um, but in that term, it's more of a confidence thing. Okay, so that's one type of pressure. The second one is driving pressure. So now this is me using my intention, kind of giving her the look, asking her to move away. And then I would back that up with adding pressure with the stick or you know you could swing you could swing the rope those would all be various forms of driving pressure so the goal there is not to touch the horse that's what you're trying to do with driving pressure steady pressure is all about putting a feel there and having them be okay with that feel um, having it be comfortable and having them be responsive to it so then we got driving pressure and then the third one is rhythmic motion okay rhythmic motion so this is now like how I need her to read the difference. So right now my intention is not for her to move. I'm kind of looking down at the ground and I want to throw this stick and string over her back. So can she read this as, oh, that's just rhythmic motion. That's not rhythmic pressure or driving pressure. And so a horse has to be able to learn to read the human's body language. You know, it's interesting when people um, get a horse, a lot of people will tell them, if you're calm, the horse will be calm. And it's like, that would be great. Like that would be really nice. Uh, but they don't come out of the box that way. <laughs> okay. That's something you have to spend some time teaching your horse. You have to teach them to read your energy versus your intention. So intention is, is what you're, you know, expecting them to do your energy. Like right now I could have high energy and be moving around and waving around a lot, but she doesn't need to move. Okay. So picture you're like, you're on a trail ride and a turkey bomb goes off. That's where a 30 pound turkey tries to take flight from the ground <laughs> and it makes a lot of racket. And we have a lot of turkeys up here in Wisconsin. So turkey takes off in the brush and you're calm. Will your horse be able to read you and stay focused on you and not the turkey? And so that's the idea. Or let's say you're, you're riding and another horse is getting wound up next to you. Is your horse gonna feed off of that horse or are they gonna stay connected with you and follow the human's intention? So this can be a challenging thing. We need to spend a lot of time uh, addressing this. So, so let's kind of jump into it. We're just gonna put her through some tests. Um, my assistant trainer, Kara, has been working with her quite a bit um, and has also done the first uh, saddling, um, which went not as good as I was expecting it to. <laughs> um, this horse is pretty good, pretty chill most of the time. And so I was expecting that first saddling to go a little bit better and I was filming another video and uh, I, Kara said, oh, do you want me to bring the saddle to the round pen? I said, no, she'll be fine, just saddle her, saddle her over by the gate. And uh, I was wrong. <laughs> she had a little bit harder time accepting the saddle. And uh, so we'll play that clip for you. But what I also want you to know is that um, we did a lot of preparation. That day, that morning, um, that horse had had a bareback pad on him, which has a cinch. That horse had, had ropes all over her. And so the theory was she was pretty well prepared and, it, and she didn't really object at all to those other things. So um, it was kind of interesting. So now, as you guys can see, <laughs> there's a pretty decent little bucking horse inside this uh, little gypsy package here. Um, she can buck pretty good. And uh, so I'm not a bronc rider. I don't claim to be. 
And so my job is to prepare this horse for her owner. That's the other thing that as a trainer I have to keep in mind. I'm not getting her used for me to ride, and I'm not a bronc rider anyways, but I'm getting her ready for her owner to ride, who you guys met in the previous uh, video. And so um, my job is to get this horse as prepared, calm, and confident as well as possible. Um, and it's basically just about getting her to understand pressure. Now, I will, say, I will put a little caveat to this. Some people can take that too far. And what I mean by that is I've seen some people, they take, you know, they have like a little baby horse and they're going to raise them up uh, to be a safe riding horse. And they like expose them to like everything <laughs> and they just really go above and beyond. And I think there's a point there where you're, you're doing too much because you want to leave some, some of the sensitivity and some of the natural instincts in there. You don't want to um, go so overboard with exposing them to things that you're, you kind of numb the horse out a little bit. So. So just keep that in mind. There, there's a balance to everything. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into some of these yields. So, so she just kind of came out. It's a little fresh here. So we're just going to move her feet a little bit. So I'm going to start with a yield. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I want her to want to stand still uh, for the confidence building games that I'm going to play with her. So I'm asking her to circle, but I'm asking her to circle with a little bit of a shape. Horses innately want to circle with a counter bend. There we go. You can see she's wanting to think out on that circle just a little bit. There we go. So there she finally got a little bit lighter on the halter. So go ahead and change directions. And we've been doing quite a bit of work in a round pen. Um, but I like to start doing some of these things out in the big space here because ultimately this is where we're going to be riding them. So things that are more achievable, like I don't think I'd ask her to canter out here just yet, um, but asking her to just circle a little bit, move her hind quarters and fore quarters. You know, we could start doing some of these things. So these are all yields. So this is me kind of basically being a little bit bossy to her, asking her to yield and turn loose to me, me kind of being in charge of where she puts her feet. But I'm doing it in real achievable ways, real easy patterns. And as the horse gets comfortable with us being in charge and also not afraid, um, this is what leads to um, a much safer horse to be around and a, and a better partnership because there has to be this level of willingness that is kind of built into it. Good. And now this horse is a five-year-old, maybe six, and didn't do a whole lot before she got here. So on one hand, things, a lot of things are new to her and so we want to build her confidence. But on the other hand, there's not a lot of work ethic there. You know, picture maybe a person who's 25 or 30 years old and never been asked to work. <laughs> like, they're going to be like, whoa, this is a ton of work. Um, compared to somebody who started to work early, you know, when they were a kid, um, they, uh, they're going to start, they're going to kind of learn a little more work ethic. Another way to say it would be like, if you're, if you're used to working um, four hours a day and somebody asks you to work eight hours a day, you're going to be like, Oh, this is hard. It's a long day, you know, but if you're only working half days like we do, 12 hours, and then you uh, put in an eight hour day, you're like, oh, this is easy. This is light work here. And so the, the point is I need to develop a little bit of work ethic where things like standing for the farrier are no longer a big deal or things like leading her down the driveway is no longer a big deal. And part of that is moving their feet. So the balance to horse training and horsemanship is building confidence and creating willingness, um, you know, through confidence and yields. Those are just two of the, the number, two things that we've, we've put a lot of, lot of emphasis on. Now, so there she read that as move because I'm doing it more of a lower, lower uh, angle with a stick and string there. There we go, and she figured it out. Good. All right, 
So we're gonna go ahead and move on to another tool here. Uh, so I'm a big fan of using a flag as a, as a training tool um, because it has just a lot of visual um, presence to it. So you can see we spent some time getting her used to this, but this is really good. So before I put a pad on them or swing a leg over, I like them to get used to something going from the ground to up on their back and just getting that to where that's just no big deal. Good. I like them to get used to something above them while she's in motion. You can see her go-to is to want to stop. And if we're going to be able to ride her and move her out, that's what most horses, when you put the first ride on, they want to do is they want to just stop. So releasing them on forward is going to be a really important, important part of that. So whatever you do on one side of the horse, you always have to do on the other side. So we're just gonna ask her to move and work that flag. And as much as we like to see the horse being calm and gentle on the ground, we have to get some movement. They, they have to find forward as relief. Um, again, what they wanna do, some horses innately, when they feel something new or new pressure, they wanna kinda of sole up and freeze up and, it's really uh, mission critical that we teach them to find relief moving forward. And I think sometimes um, when people that are newer to colt starting, they wanna release the horse standing still all the time. You know, because we, we some, some people kinda of get in their mind that that's the be all end all, but the reality is they gotta get relief in motion because that's what we're gonna do uh, when we're sitting on them. So I don't like that to be something new um, on the ground that we're exposing them to. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back to some yields again. And this time, it's gonna be more about steady pressure. So there's a, there's a rhyme and a reason behind everything that I'm doing, okay? Um, so we're kind of alternating between different yields. Very good. So now I'm gonna ask her to back up off the halter. So I'm gonna put a feel and I'm gonna tap her. There we go. So she's not learning this for the first time, but she needs to get um, cooperative with it. You know, it's pretty easy and, the, and you're gonna find, you know, if you work with many horses that like this, she's a draft cross. Those are, they're, they tend to be kind of thick skinned and what that means is they tend to be a little bit dull just innately and it's easy for them to wear pressure. You know, obviously she's gonna feel different than a horse like an Arabian or a thoroughbred or uh, something that has a little bit more, uh, more sensitivity. Yeah, oh, I like that, that was much better. So whatever, whatever my expectations are, they need to be calibrated for the horse that I'm working with. And so one of the principles of horsemanship that I follow is work with the horse where they're at, okay? So that means whatever level the feel is, um, whatever pressure she's accepting or not accepting or willing to do or not willing to do, I have to meet her right there and expect her to be 1% better than wherever that, wherever that is, okay? So I noticed a couple times now she's got a little reactive with things going around her head. So I just have to keep an eye on that and maybe uh, do a few more. I like, I like to stand on this offside and ask for that yield because it's a little harder than me switching sides. You know, then she got used to me flipping this rope over her. <clears throat> now, one of the things that you're, you're probably noticing, it's like, could I move around this horse a little bit more politely? Yes, yes I could. <laughs> that's not the point. Because I could very quickly turn into, if you have a horse that's a little bit reactive to movements around them, you can pretty quickly start to be sneaky around them. And that is the last thing you wanna do is, is put a leg over a colt that's a little bit underexposed. Like you see her kind of spook right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and drive her hindquarters and just let her run into a little bit of pressure for spooking. Because that tells me she wasn't with me she was thinking about something in the bushes. And then this is where a lot of people like to chime in. 
oh, well, there was a, there was a snake on the ground, or oh, there was a bicyclist coming, or there was some reason that they, something new that gives them a reason to spook. There's not really a reason to spook. There's nothing, if there's nothing in here that I need to run away from, there's nothing in here that she needs to run away from, <laughs> okay? And so if I'm the one who's in charge, I need to be the one that also says we should be getting away from this or not. So if I didn't say we need to run, everybody save themselves, if I didn't call that out, then she needs to stay connected with me and not focus on that. Now, that is something that's gonna be built and developed over time. That's not just gonna happen overnight. Um, but I have a choice there when she spooks. I can let it go and pretend like it didn't happen. I could go take her over to the fence of wherever she was spooking at, or I could just make that thought uncomfortable and say, hey, stay here with me and don't worry about those other things. Because the, the reality is you can't expose a horse to everything there is for them to be scared of. It's in their DNA to, to be a prey animal. And you can see she's already chilled out. So by me yielding her hindquarters, I'm not punishing her for spooking. I'm redirecting her attention back onto me. And there's a big difference between the two. I didn't go, oh, you're in trouble and now I'm mad at you and there's none of that happened. I just put a little bit of pressure on her and I did something different. I redirected her attention back onto me, okay? Now we're trying to isolate the flexion in her head and neck. So here if she moves, I'm just gonna follow her here and just stay with it. And when you do this, make sure you're far enough out of the way that there's room for their head to bend. Also notice I'm not pulling on the rope, I'm holding. So there, as soon as she stopped and she gave to it, she got relief, okay? It's really easy from this position to pull. And what I like to do is I find where there's the feel there and then I hold and then I wait for them to step off of it. And then I can ask again. So it's right about there where she kind of goes, I need to move my feet. And that's because she just feels a little claustrophobic here. And so she would rather kind of get out of that by, by moving her feet versus bending her head and neck more. The other thing I got to consider is based on the way she's built, she's not going to be as flexible as, as like an Arabian or a thoroughbred. So my expectations of how much she flexes uh, needs to be realistic. But this is my, um, you know, when you first ride a colt, they don't have a, a stop yet. And so my, my go-to is going to be to bend her to the side to regain control. And when the dust settles, that's when I'll release her. So she needs to understand this. Okay. We just kind of hit a point where she went, that's far enough. There, she stopped and gave her a split second. Then she stepped out of it. So I'll go ahead and give her a release and then we'll try again. These are the little things that you invested this time in and making sure there's a connection to your idea. So there she's getting soft, but she's moving her feet. So I need her to stop and get soft there. There, very good. So that one's a little bit tougher. So let's go ahead and we're gonna make our way to the round pen now and uh, do a little uh, well, what I call rope therapy. One of the things that I think is a great uh, tool for starting colts is a lariat rope. And um, it just gets them used to just things being around them all over the place uh, before we put that saddle on. I'm gonna go ahead and put this around her butt here. I think it was Tom Dorrance that used to say, there's not a bad place on a horse to hang a rope. <laughs> and uh, what that means is if you're gonna really kind of expose your horse and get them gentle and used to things, um, again, this is preparation for riding, but if I get her used to this rope all over, um, one, of the, one of the owner's goals was for this horse to be a little bit better with her feet. So if I get this horse used to being handled um, more by her feet with the rope. And uh, it's just, it's, the first stage of this is just accepting the rope being on her. And then the second stage is then asking them to follow a feel. 
Um, so you imagine she's going to be a lot better behaved for the farrier, for the veterinarian. Again, we want to release on forward here though. So the same, same theme. Now I'll just put a little feel. Again, I'm just putting a light feel and when she stops and gives, then I'm going to release it there. So she had a choice there. She could panic and take off running. She could kick out and, and, and uh, you know, feel threatened by it. She chose to stop and give. That's, those are the signs that I'm looking for. To, for her to prove to me that I could be sitting on her back and she could puzzle solve. That she could work through understanding things while I'm on her and that's what would be safe. If she has a meltdown every time um, something new is, is presented to her, then she's not ready for, to, to have a new thing be presented to her on her back. Does that make sense? So what I'm doing is I'm trying to um, get my rope off her foot. <laughs> Anybody can catch something, but can you get your rope off? Apparently not. Oh, there it is. Now, again, this is this uh, a lot of things that I show on this channel, I, I try to make them be um, things that most people could do or try with their horses. Um, this stuff that I'm doing with the rope, if you're not familiar with handling a rope, this could be dangerous. You know, at, at best, you could just get some rope burn, but at worst, you could get it tangled up around your feet or something like that. So um, this is one of the more uh, professional level things that I'm, I am doing here that you'd want to have some experience. In other words, if you wanted to do this, but you've never done it before, don't go find a wild horse to put the rope on. Um, go find a, an old gentle one and uh, practice your rope handling technique, okay? get better at that. So we're gonna let her move her feet here a little bit. Again, we kind of alternate between confidence and yield. So this yield is now me driving her forward. Really like that little canter departure there. That was good. Again, this horse has been saddled already. So it's like theoretically, I could just come out here and saddle her up, but she wanted to bronc pretty good with that saddle, as you guys seen earlier in the video. And so because she wanted to bronc with it, instead of trying to get in a habit of teaching her to buck with the saddle on, we're, I'm gonna continue to do preparation. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now is more about her getting to, to accept that saddle. So you can see we got the rope around her neck, then it's on the outside of her hip here. And I'm gonna look for an opportunity to ask her to follow the feel. So maybe right there, we got the fence. So I'm gonna hold and wait for her to step off the rope. Good. Now with this mare in particular, it's a balance between holding and giving her a chance to follow a feel, but also putting enough pressure on that she doesn't learn to wear it. The other thing I like about this is you see how I end up behind her a lot? So this is helping me with the confidence that I would get from driving a horse, ground driving a horse. I don't do a ton of ground driving when I start them. If I have a horse that I'm going, I don't really want to get on you yet. You might, you might still want to buck pretty good. Then I might do some ground driving, but most of the time I just do some things like this. So that that horse gets used to me being around them in other places, not just on their back or not just in front of them. So in other words, a lot of people, when they do ground work, they always release the horse facing them. But at some point, you need to get the horse comfortable moving away from you. Put a feel here and hold. Good. So I'm liking all that. So now, so she passed all that with flying colors. Again, that was just testing, testing how that's going, seeing where she's at. Instead of just saddling her up and hoping that it works out, we'd rather be prepared than lucky is the idea. So now I'm going to put my lead rope back on because now... I'm gonna move this lariat rope to where the cinch would go on the saddle. And I'm gonna practice tightening, tightening this up on her. <clears throat> and you guys have seen me use some of these techniques when I'm evaluating a horse that's already known to have some issues. Um, but this is also just some stuff that we do with colt starting. And I don't always do these steps with colts. I really try to work with every horse where they're at. So if they're really wanting to buck with that saddle um, and she bucked pretty good with it, I'm gonna go ahead and take some of these extra steps because not only do I not wanna get bucked off when I'm riding her, but I also don't want to get in a habit of her, her getting saddled and her starting to buck. 
Um, leave, a, leave a note in the comments. Do you know of a horse that every time you saddle them up, they buck? Okay. Um, I know of a couple horses that are like that, and that's not very fun. It's not a very fun deal if you know when you saddle them, they're going to buck. And chances are, for most horses, that could have been fixed or prevented when they were getting started. But horses are pattern animals, and they're creatures of habit. So if they get in the habit of doing that, you know, and all it would take is saddling them up three days in a row and letting them buck like crazy, and now you've got a pattern of that. Because when they buck hard, they're pretty scared. And when they quit bucking, they find relief. And so if they think that bucking gave them relief, then they're going to keep going to that. Okay, so now I'm just going to pull on this and, and kind of mimic a cinch. So I'm, I'm trying to pull pretty hard because, again, it's mimicking a cinch. I don't want her to yield to it. I just want her to wear it. And uh, to me, she handled that really well. And it's sliding back a little further on her belly, but that's okay. I want her to get used to this everywhere. So it's not a flank rope here, it's still a cinch. And to me, she's, she's handling that super well, okay? So again, this was part of the accept the saddle. You saw me do some things that were accepting pressure. We did a couple things now for getting preparation for accepting the saddle. Now I think we need to do a little bit of accepting the human, okay? The last but not least step is accepting the rider, which is where the person's on her back and they're the ones um, asking the horse to move and turn and stop and all that. Because you can ride a horse and just, just have them accept a human and kind of wear a human on their back, which is the way we do it for the first couple of rides. And then as we kind of get into that third through fifth ride, we start transitioning to accepting the rider, where the rider starts to ask for more up there. But if the rider gets on and is immediately the one telling the horse where to go and what to do, that can become too much pressure. So we try to separate those variables of just a human on their back, being okay with that, moving around, and then um, a human that is now active and asking that horse to move and yield. So we're going to go ahead and uh, do some accept the human preparation here, and then we'll go ahead and get the saddle out. So there's a couple things that I like to do um, for the accept the human. Also, leave a comment below and let me know what you think of how she is for the first week. Now, I know you guys haven't seen everything, but to me, she's doing pretty good for for a weekend compared to what we started with here. So I'm asking her just to kind of stand still here, and then I'm gonna run up to her, kind of waving and jumping around, and uh, just getting her used to this. Does anybody know the name of this technique that I'm using here? So when you mount a colt bareback before mounting them with the saddle, who invented this technique? I'll give you guys a chance to put your answer in. Any of you that said it's the Jeffries method, you would be correct. I believe his name was Cal Jeffrey. He was an Australian, and he was the first guy to kind of, he put a horse in a small pen, and he started to just go, could I just get this horse used to the human just being around him and get him to accept that? <clears throat> she's pretty tall, and she's kind of got a big barrier to get around, so I don't know if we're going to get all the way up there. I don't, I don't want to show off, you know. I'm just going to kind of leave it here. Now when I get switch sides, I do like to change eyes there. I don't need her to flex. I just need her to have her attention over here. I'll just face so you guys can see the technique a little bit better. And one of the things that we'll do with this that I kind of add to it is if the horse wants to move their feet, I'll create a pattern of driving them around. And so the horse starts to read that difference of this is the human being active and driving. And then this is the human getting soft and asking them to settle. Very good. Driving, 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 and settling. Get her nose tip just slightly. I don't like them to be angled away because if they're angled away and they get spooked in this process, they can like blink of an eye, turn and kick out. And so if their nose is already tipped just slightly towards me, I feel like uh, that's an advantage. There we go. All right. Who didn't think I was going to get up here?
So this to me is, is just a really important step because if, uh, if you skip this, when you go to step on them with a saddle on, it does not feel very good. <laughs> you know, to me, you're really getting to know that horse very personally um, when you're, when you're stepping, stepping all around them here. <clears throat> because if you imagine, especially if I use the mounting block, I could get up there a lot slicker and smoother with a mounting block versus me getting up there bareback. And um, what, what happens then is we could be sneaking a ride on there. And that's what we don't want to do. We want to expose them to that human uh, kind of being all over and getting used to that. Now, when I, earlier when I threw the rope over her head, she did get a little bothered by that. So I'm just going to take some time here and get her used to that. See how she wants to brace her head up there. Part of the reason I'm doing this is if I was sitting on her and I had reins in my hands, I would hate for the reins to bother her and cause her to get uncomfortable if they started flopping. You know, if she starts trotting around or... When I was uh, first training horses, like I was a year or two into training horses, um, I was riding this mare and I had slobber straps. And back in the day, I, I did very, very little preparation. Some of you may not know this, but when I was in high school, I was actually a, um, did some bareback bronc riding. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was pretty keen to just go ahead and crawl on any of them and do whatever. Um, and so this mare, I, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to do anything bad or harsh to her, but I didn't, there was more lack of preparation. So anyways, I'm sitting on this horse. She's got slobber straps on the reins, which is leather that comes down to a rope rein. And she wasn't very prepared to ride at all. And she starts backing up. And when she backs up, the reins started to flop because I didn't do this step. As the reins flopped, she backed up faster. As she backed up faster, the reins flopped more. As she, the reins flopped more, she backed up faster and run around we went until she flipped over. And my life flashed before my eyes when that happened. I mean, I, it was really close. I just, fortunately, she went enough off to the side that she landed on my leg. I didn't get hurt at all. Scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and so ever since then, I've been more diligent about preparing it. And that's kind of what a lot of horse trainers end up as is when, when we make a big mistake like that. Go ahead and get your rope off. You kind of got your, This is ground tying, guys. This is how you ground tie a horse. So we're just going to let her put her foot there. It's her job to keep it there and tie her head down. I'm kidding, but please, seriously, I don't want to move you now. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we when you make a big mistake like that and something happens that's real dramatic, it gets you to pay attention and, and you listen up, and that's learning from experience. And I am very experienced. I joke about that at clinics a lot because to me, experience is what you get after you make the mistakes. And then it's like you think about it, that's a pretty true statement there. Experience is what you get after you make the mistake. Learning and knowledge is what happens when you just, you know, somebody shows you something. So think about that next time you're uh, going in for an operation or something. So I'm going through a lot of these things fairly quick with her because these are not her first time having these things done. Got this beautiful five-star pad. And let me just take a minute here to tell you about five-star pads. One of the most important pieces of equipment you're gonna use with your horse is your saddle pad. Obviously you need your saddle to fit. But your saddle pad is going to be what's protecting your horse's back and it's going to be what's close to their skin. There's a few qualities in a saddle pad that I think are really important. Number one is it needs to be protecting my horse's back. I don't need my horse coming up sore when I'm riding him because the pad wasn't helping me out there. I need that pad to be comfortable for my horse. And natural materials like wool are really great for helping wick moisture away and keeping the back cool while you're riding them. The third thing is that pad needs to be durable and it needs to hold up to a lot of use. We're going to be putting a lot of hours in the saddle and I need that pad to be there for me. Five Star Pads has really put all that together. They've made a 100% natural wool pad that is shaped really well for the horse's back, is made very durable, it offers a lot of comfort, and it's a great pad made right here in the USA. So if you're in the market for a new pad, make sure you shop with Five Star Pads. There'll be a link in the description below. If I'm being perfectly honest with you, um, I'm, I was not that familiar with Five Star Pads until I got this pad. I knew they were great pads based on other people used them and, and were, would sing their praise, that sort of thing. Um, but I was super impressed. If you look at how this pad, the, how it conforms to the horse and how it rises up here, it gives them lots of space. One of the things that drives me nuts and I'm big on when other people are saddling horses for me is getting this pad hoiked up into the saddle. But see that clearance? I can put my whole hand under there and I can feel where that saddle is fitting there. And I don't I mean, I know they put effort into conforming it and how it's stitched and the leather's there, but this pad just sits a horse like amazingly well. So I'm a big fan of, uh, 
of five star pads and I'm really grateful for them sending me this pad to try out. <clears throat> I think now we just need one with my logo on it and then we'll be, then we'll be in real good shape. So again, I'm going through this kind of quick here. If you would like to see a full, full video on all the steps for Colt starting really broken down and explained really well, I have some Colt starting videos on my Patreon page. We'll leave a link for that in the description. Um, that, but I'm just, this is kind of showing you guys more where she's at. Um, YouTube is more the lighter version of horse training. If you want to see the real stuff, go to Patreon. No, no, I show you everything here on YouTube as well. I just go, I just get into a little more depth of each piece and explaining each one more thoroughly. And then people can also ask me questions and that sort of thing. So when I first saddle them, I like to just ease them off, whether it's me walking around them or it's just her walking out on a circle. You know, if you had a horse that had a lot of go, I probably wouldn't put them on a circle. I'd probably just walk around them in a circle, um, yielding their hindquarters. But that saddle's not fully tightened up yet. It's tight enough that I could probably stop her, but if she continued to bronc, uh, it wouldn't hold. And so I want her to just breathe, wear that saddle a little bit, just have a real positive experience. If you, and this is the balance, and this is what takes experience to get good at. If I over tighten it to make sure that saddle doesn't roll, which is also important, I run the risk of making her feel even more claustrophobic by cutting her in two with that cinch um, right off the bat. So, so just there's there's all these little things that makes the difference of somebody being experienced at this, you know. And it's funny because I get I, I read the comments, not all of them, but I read a lot of the comments. And um, there's a few people that love to hate on this channel, <laughs> and it's interesting because I would really be curious of what their level of horsemanship is when they have all kinds of advice for me. Um, so just when you're, when you're getting advice from people, just be careful who you're taking advice from. I've literally started over 1300 Colts. So it's like, it's not like I've just, just started doing this. And if you've started one horse, you have some experience, more experience than somebody who has not started a horse. If you started 10, you got more experience than that person that did one. If you've done a hundred, well, now you're starting to get somewhere. If you've done a thousand, now you're, you're, a, you're an expert at this. Okay. You started a thousand Colts. You're, you're an expert. I got another quick question. I've asked you guys a lot of questions in this video, but we'll ask you another one. How many of you guys would like to see me compete in Road to the Horse Colt starting competition? Okay, so leave that, leave that in the comments. Um, I've flirted with that idea a little bit over the, over the years. And they even flirted back a little bit. <laughs> so you're kind of getting that bend and pushing through her ribs there. She's getting a little worried about that corner right there. So those are the spots that if you can kind of catch them and put a little bit of pressure on is good. So you can see she's accepting the saddle better and better. Good, so we'll leave her be there. This is where that lightness comes in, right? If I have to put a ton of pressure to get her to canter while she's wearing that saddle, that would be more reason for her to think about bucking. So it's so important that we create that lightness on the ground before that saddle gets on. We're gonna do that one more time the other way for good measure. And then I'm gonna go a couple of quick pre-ride checks. Something else I'll just mention while we're doing this. I've had a lot of people comment, um, like, how come you didn't use the join up method or this or that? And a lot of the techniques that they're suggesting requires just running the horse around and tiring them out. And there's nothing wrong with a horse getting some exercise. If they're standing in a small pen or a stall, and they're getting a lot of feed, they need to move their feet and get some exercise. But if we're out here for an hour, hour and a half, they're gonna get some exercise by default anyways, right? Um, but to, to me, what I don't want to do is if I need to wear the horse out before I apply my techniques to get results, I probably could use some better techniques. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say, say, say to that. So one of the things that can get a horse scared when you're sitting on them is your legs moving. You know, they're not, they not, not always used to that. So I'm going to attach this <clears throat> lariat rope here. And I'm going to do it in two different ways. And um, shout out to a friend of mine named Elsa B. She, uh, she's a trainer and rancher out in uh, North Dakota. And um, I watched her do this technique and I hadn't used it before. Um, not this particular one, it's the next one that I'm gonna show. Oops, 
course I got my rope all tangled up. These layout ropes tangle up fast and that's why you, uh, how you put them away is important and knowing what you're doing when you're using them so that you catch that before you put a foot through that. So you can see, I just wave that stirrup at her and just let her kind of get used to that. Very good. So you can see that's pretty easy for her. And you can see when, I, when something's working for me, I don't sit there and camp out on it and drill for oil. We just go ahead and move on to the next thing. So for this, the next thing is gonna be changing directions, but watch, I'm just gonna put this rope over the saddle here. <clears throat> and uh, it's a lot scarier having that rope on the offside, which is interesting because it's kind of doing the same thing essentially, but for some reason, because it's on that offside, so you guys can watch as it goes by there. You can see how that moving. And that's a, just a really great, really great exposure tool. Yeah. Looking pretty good. Whatever you do on one side, you always want to do on the other side. So go ahead and change that out. Test her out there. And then we might be just about ready to crawl on. So yeah, you can see she's she's responding to that very well. Okay, now there's one last thing I want to do with that, and then we'll think about stepping up on her. Started leaning on that halter there. And a lot of times when she feels extra heavy, it's coming from her being a little worried and feeling like she needs to put herself in a position um, that I'm not putting her in. And um, that's where a lot of times I'll, I'll kind of catch her there and put just a little bit more pressure and say, hey, you don't have to be responsible for that. I can, I can take care of that. So we got our cool reins here. These have these nice little connectors. And then it's got a ring halter. And uh, this makes it a lot easier to get a horse bent around to the side. Um, with a ring halter versus uh, the regular halter. I had a horse um, rear up and almost flip over on me because it, it started to buck when I was riding them and I was trying to bend them and uh, the horse started kind of coming up and over. And it was a really sensitive uh, three-year-old colt. But ever since then, I realized that my tool wasn't helping me out bending this horse to the side. It was, uh, was kind of just the horse's nose was down here instead of around to the side. So one of the things I'm gonna do here is ask her to move her hip with the stirrup. So I'm putting a feel here with the reins. Oh. So again, there's a little spook there and we're gonna make that uncomfortable. So again, I want her to learn that when she's spooky, she's gonna run into a little bit more pressure. Now here I gotta just wait for her to settle in and wait for her feet to slow down and her to kind of wear that pressure a little bit. Right there. You can see her feet slowing down. Good, there's a good spot to quit. You know, it's funny too, because I think a lot of people think all draft crosses or all gypsy horses are all innately really gentle and quiet. And uh, this horse is actually one of the more spooky gypsy horses that I've worked with. You know, she's not that fast. <laughs> um, I don't think I need to say anything more about that, but she's not that fast of a horse, but she is a little bit sensitive and spooky in terms of being aware of worrying about other things. Now, part of that is needing some more handling, but um, I'm kind of, as we get to know her more and more, I'm kind of learning that innately she's a pretty sensitive horse. So <clears throat> I'm gonna tighten my cinch up one more time. So now it's riding tight. So that would be the third time. So I tighten up my cinch in three, three increments. Because what's interesting is I pulled the same amount each time 
but because she's relaxing and breathing more, there was slack in that latigo where I could, I could take it up another notch each time. I'm gonna lower the back cinch down just a little bit there. And I do that because a lot of horses, when they, you know, if they were to get tight, they kind of swell up through there. And she has more reasons to get tight and bothered with me on her than what she does on the ground. And so now there's just a little more room for that, <clears throat> for that to happen. One of the things I like to test when I'm stepping up on them is, can I lower their head? So whatever it takes for me to lower her head on the ground is what it should also take for me to lower her head um, if I'm on her back. And if that changes, that tells me she's gotten more tense because now the humans change from being on the ground to being on her back. And so I like to just kind of reach down there sometimes and, and just a quick observation, it's like as I'm stepping up and down, you know, is she, is she okay with this? And I like to have their head tipped just slightly towards me. <clears throat> so again, just like the bareback mounting, you wanna step up and down on both sides, both sides of the horse, kind of find out where they're at. All right, I'm thinking this horse is about ready for a ride. And uh, I'm gonna leave you guys right there, cliffhanger. Thank you guys for tuning and watching. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for the next video to see how the ride goes.